You get no sunlight. You don't know when a new day starts. You're not getting fed. Um, they were giving me pills. The only time I actually, because it was a dry cell, I'll explain that to you. There's a drain on the floor. You're in a box with a raised cement ledge. I had uh, a Velcro suit on, which is what I later found out it's for suicide watch people. I was never suicidal, never been suicidal. I don't know why I was in that, but they took that away from me later too, so I was completely naked. <laughs> they would come by banging on the door, and they left the light on really, really bright. So I'm, I'm getting this medication I never had. You don't just cut it off like that. you you, you got to step it down. They cut off my medications, and they were giving me Thorazine. And that's the only time I would have anything to drink. Uh, and that, that's kind of how I knew generally what when a day elapsed was when I got my Thorazine. What I did say in, in the IRB hearing was that I know for sure that if five uh, Toronto police officers and a CBSA enforcement officer did not come to our door on Wednesday uh, after that Easter weekend, that my son would not be sitting in a suicide smock and he would not have had to go to the hospital Oakville twice from Maplehurst Correctional Facility. He would have been fine. I, mean, I know that CBSA has a job to do and their job is to protect Canadian society from potential harm. I understand that. I was a military officer. I understand their role. Um, the way that you do that says a lot about you. Um, I, I, there are a lot of similarities between those kinds of things and the way the U.S. is operating currently with the treatment of its own citizens. And the key word is humanity. When you dehumanize people, anything can happen. When you dehumanize people, Guantanamo Bay can happen. When you dehumanize people, Abu Ghraib can happen. When you dehumanize people, you can make them slaves. I mean, if things work out exactly the way we would want them to and the way that we would hope that they would, that uh, Matt's claim of torture would be recognized not only by the UN, which we've appealed to a number of times, but by the Canadian government, that he would be, and we would be allowed to remain in Canada. Um, if Matt were to look back over his lifetime, the, the time that he spent by himself uh, in the spring of uh, 2010, uh, studying French in Montreal and then getting ready to study uh, in at PEI uh, were probably the happiest days of his life. He was on his own. He felt that I can't, unless you've lived under uh, a feeling where you're being watched all the time, it sounds like paranoia, but when you, you know that's a potential reality, to be able to be somewhere where you don't feel that way anymore, you actually feel free, uh, is liberating. And so we certainly would, in, in the best case scenario, love to be able to stay here and be productive citizens in Canada. In terms of why we came to Canada, uh, as opposed to staying where we were, we'd spent, um, well, from Matt's arrest in January of 2010, when he was studying in, or ready, getting ready to study in Canada, coming back across the border, arrested, interrogated about national security matters. Uh, from our perspective, tortured. Uh, denied food, denied water, uh, fed psycho uh, psychological drugs, had a psychotic break. Um, from that time until uh, the time we decided to leave, we exhausted every single resource we had. Um, financially, we sold our condominium, uh, we drained our retirement accounts. We went through everything we could to uh, go through the system. We went through lawyers, we attended hearings, and we continued to do everything we were possible. We contacted the American Civil Liberties Union, the Center for Constitutional Rights, we contacted Human Rights Watch, uh, Amnesty International. Uh, no one wants to say that the United States government uh, tortures people. Matt and his family allege that the charges of pedophilia made against him are not only false, but when he was taken in by law enforcement that he was tortured and that really there is a, a far more complicated, convoluted, and mysterious uh, national security case that is underway. And given what I have both seen about the case and what I've heard from uh, Adrian Humphreys, who's, who's writing this story, there's significant holes on the side of the U.S. Uh, government's case against Matthew enough holes that it does uh, merit significant more attention, um, especially because Matt's charges and his family's charges against uh, the U.S. government are just really quite uh, damning at the moment. What Canada is trying to do at the moment is, I think it's Rule 37 or 34, one of those, declare me a national security risk prior to my refugee hearing. 
I, I think that's in bad faith because I gave them all the, all the information regarding national security that they, that they have, and they're using that all against me. It, it's part of my case. That's my defense to show the United States not only tortured me, but falsely charged me of child... Stack that on top of it, which isn't like, well, he's here in spite of the child pornography. So they, they tack that on to torture. It, it's doubly... It's, <laughs> I'm, already, I'm already trashed. My reputation is gone. He's can't smear somebody more than that. For me personally, the trigger that, that really caused me to go to this length was uh, the death of Aaron Schwartz in 2013. And here's a young man, internet activist, about the same age as Matt, probably the same uh, intellectual makeup in terms of his savviness on the internet and computer savviness, um, and probably as far as his sensitivity goes. You know, we know that Matt's been diagnosed with attention deficit disorder and depression since high school. And so, uh, you know, you had Aaron Schwartz uh, being hounded by a federal prosecutor in Connecticut, I believe it was, uh, for uh, getting into the MIT database, I believe. And MIT wasn't even willing to press charges, but this federal prosecutor was threatening him, just the threat of that hanging over his head. He committed suicide. And for me personally, I did not want to wake up one day and find my son hanging from a rope in the garage. I will say that anything that is on the official record about what Matt did uh, or did not do in the Russian embassy or what he did or did not talk about is, uh, are, are from FBI reports written well after the fact. And so um, there's going to be a certain spin on that is what they said he said. We do know for, for, for a fact that uh, the, uh, the day that Matt was interrogated, the second day Matt was interrogated on the, on the weekend of um, August the 6th, 7th and 8th of 2010, uh, the, he was arrested on the 6th at the end of the day. That evening, early in the morning, or somewhere around after midnight, he was taken to a hospital with a psychotic break. He continued to be interrogated, even though he's released in guarded condition uh, that same day by the FBI. And that report that, of, of that interrogation is classified. Um, Matt maintains that when he was uh, stopped at the border for uh, the espionage questioning early in the morning of August the 6th of 2010, that he was taken off-site uh, uh, in shackles, therefore under arrest, although not said he was under arrest, and he was administered a drug. At that point, he felt um, that he was no longer, uh, who knows? Uh, I do know that when you give people th drugs like Thorazine, they're liable to say anything. And so I can't account for the things that he said or did not say to um, the FBI agents about what he was or was not doing in the Russian embassy. My understanding of why he wanted to go to the Russian embassy was to seek the protection of someone who would be willing to stand up to the United States government. Taking Matt to the Russian embassy in, in Washington, D.C., it was February. Uh, D.C. had had the worst snowstorm they'd had in 20, 30 years. I mean, just tremendous amount of snow. He had planned to take a bus originally, and I decided to drive him for safety reasons, and I wanted to spend time talking with him on the way. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that seems really hard to describe because uh, I really believed it was the last time that, that I was going to see my son. And so um, Matt tells me later in, in these interrogations with the FBI that they recorded everything we'd said in the car. They have all this on, you know, tape and pictures and whatnot. So, I mean, they have a recording of me bawling all the way back to the hotel room. And so, um, you know, when I said goodbye, I thought that was the last time that I would see him. So currently the name Anonymous is used to organize protest activity and it has garnered massive law enforcement attention and there have been many arrests, especially of hackers who were involved in Anonymous. However, prior to the period uh, that we're now in, uh, law enforcement was also interested in Anonymous back when they were more uh, involved in trolling activities. So for example, uh, in 2009, a fusion center in Virginia, uh, a center kind of involved with uh, tracking uh, terrorist activities, uh, described Anonymous as a terrorist organization. I went back to the embassy and, and they started asking me about drones and they <laughs> tried to shake me down from information, um, told me it wasn't practical for me to leave for them to get me out of there. But what they wanted to do was, well, we'll pay you for this information, that kind of stuff. I, I wasn't going to do that. I mean, you're going to take me as an employee. I'm not selling you information. And I wasn't in the military anymore anyway, so it's not like I have a ready supply of information. And personally, I wouldn't do that. I haven't done that. And 
they uh, started asking me questions. They started with my people in, the, in my military unit, what the connection was to, between them, me, and the Russian embassy, and they started asking between connection between the people, my military unit, and Anonymous. The first day was much more about DC and the embassy. Um, subsequent interrogations, from what I remember, much, much more to do with Anonymous and WikiLeaks. Because at that time, they didn't know tons about Anonymous, and that's a priority for them. The events first happened in, in January of 2010, uh, when they came and uh, did a search on our home. Um, uh, we had this search warrant uh, with, with uh, inventory that wasn't filled out, and it was very vague and just left at our house, so everything was tossed all around, and we were just flabbergasted. We, we didn't even have any dealings with lawyers, didn't even know what to do. Uh, and so I remember thinking, you know, it, it had FBI on there somewhere. I was thinking the federal government's involved and this is, this is going to be handled professionally. Unfortunately, that's not our experience. And there were so many unconstitutional things that happened in this process that you just started, questions just started popping up. Why did this happen? Why did that happen? Things that just didn't, made no sense. They were looking for child pornography between Memphis, Tennessee and Indiana where we lived. We didn't know anybody in Memphis, Tennessee. So right away we're thinking, what's that all about? Um, besides the fact that, you know, Matt's lived with us his whole life, with the exception of the time that he was in Canada. We know him, we know his character. He's never shown any predilection towards pedophilia or anything like that, so we know that wasn't true. So we're thinking, what's this all about? And those kinds of questions continue to be raised. From his arrest at the border uh, in 2010, his interrogation on an espionage matter, to no access to counsel, uh, kept incommunicado for uh, those several days there when no one can talk to him, no one knew what was going on, to the medical bills we got in the mail wanting us to pay for hospitalization, didn't even know he was hospitalized, and, and what's this going, what's happening? Our son's been hospitalized and they're sending us the medical bills. And when you tried to ask questions of the government, they, they, we've tried to get the government to give us the records of his interrogations, transcripts of what they asked him, information about what his, uh, who saw him in the jail up there in Maine in 2010, none of that's provided. The attitude is hubris. It's, we don't have to give it to you because we're the federal government. We did some reading after all, all this happened about people that are arrested for child pornography charges. And generally speaking, when, when you see what happens to people, they come in, they raid a home, uh, come, they find some evidence of child pornography, the person is arrested and that's it. They came in our home for two and a half, three hours, tossed everything, looked over everything. Matt's computer was up and running, and no child pornography was found at all. He wasn't arrested. He was just left with no, no, just no. What are you supposed to do with this? What, you know, oh, here you are. That's it. And you ask questions, and lawyers tell you, don't, uh, don't rock the boat, don't stir the beehive. You don't want to ask any questions. So we're we're left there in limbo. What are we going to do? So Matt was involved in anonymous in an era. Uh where there was not a lot of academic or journalistic attention placed on Anonymous. It was an era where people were really involved in internet pranking and, and hacking and trolling, uh, where people organized activity anonymously and in really hidden fashion. However, uh, his claims that he was running a Tor hidden service, that he was involved in some early organizing is completely in line with what Anonymous was doing in the era. Nobody's going to defend anybody that's charged with child pornography. It's, it's, I'm not saying it's not a problem, because it is a problem, but when they use that as a cover for something else, I mean, it's almost unquestioning. Nobody's, nobody wants to look at the case. Nobody wants to talk about it in the media. Um, they just want to make it go away. If that involves putting someone in prison or groups of people in prison, well, so what? It's better safe than sorry. And that's the attitude. Once you're painted with that, it's you never get the stench of that off of you. It, it doesn't matter if someone's guilty, not guilty. Personally, I, I would have never been opposed to fighting that in court, but that's not what it was about. Um, I don't have child pornography on my stuff. Didn't have it at the time. Never had it. <laughs> um, I wasn't concerned about that. I thought they were going to come back from my thumb drives. From that moment, I knew what they were there for, and they wanted my server, and they wanted information related to Anonymous. 
So Matthew uh, DeHart has made certain claims about his involvement in Anonymous. So for example, he claimed he was running a Tor hidden service. And he certainly, from what I've seen, has the technical capacities and ideological commitments to be running such a service. He also claims that he was involved in the making of the first anonymous video for Project Chinology, the project that was protesting the Church of Scientology. And he does have information uh, that no one else would have except for the people who were involved at the time. It was a small group of eight people and many of them were acting anonymously. So they didn't know who um, the other person was and he holds very specific information that only people who were uh, making the video that night would know. So given these details, it does seem credible that he was involved definitely in some capacity with Anonymous in its early stages at least. Project Chinology was really a constitutional moment for Anonymous. It was the turning point uh, prior to Chinology, which was a protest against the Church of Scientology. Anonymous had only engaged in trolling raids against targets and organizations, and, and trolling is a kind of form of internet pranking. With Chinology uh, Anonymous, which collected uh, different individuals on the internet, they organized to engage in a more traditional activist endeavor. And this was in, in 2008, where that transition from pure internet pranking to a kind of irreverent activism was born. We're relatively tech savvy, but we didn't grow up with the internet. So, I mean, you know, we had AOL and thought that that was cutting edge, you know, because it was easy. Um, but Mac grew up on it, so he knows all this stuff. I mean, he had in his room from probably, I don't know, 2007, 6, whenever, whenever the movie V for Vendetta came out, you know, they had the Guy Fox masks. And so he had two Guy Fox masks in his room hanging from his uh, bedroom curtains and, you know, we didn't think anything about it. We didn't even know what Anonymous was. Personally, um, I didn't really get involved involved until 2006. I mean, 2005, it's, well, we're Anonymous and people are joking around on the message board. But uh, I didn't really consider myself a member of Anonymous, probably until 2006. And again, it's not, you don't have to sign a membership form. Anybody can be Anonymous.